Hi there, it's Ron Gula with the Gula Tech Cyber Fiction Show. Today we've got NFL football player and investor Kelvin Beecham Jr. Kelvin, how's it going? It's going well, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us today on the on the show. Where are you joining us from? Uh, Chandler, Arizona. Uh, so a couple miles south of uh, of Phoenix, the capital. And why are you out there? Uh, so I train out here um, every off season. Um, been coming out here since 2013, um, started building a family. And once, once the family started to grow from me and my wife to me and three kids, we felt that it was probably smart to, to set up shop out here. And, um, back in 2017, bought a house and now we're out here full time, uh, plan for the cards now. So really out here full time. That's phenomenal. So today we're going to talk about a little bit of football, but we all love, well, all love the NFL football. But really, we got connected through a gentleman we just actually had on the show, David Weinstein, yeah. and you do investing. So we're going to talk about investing as well. So um, if you don't mind, give us give us your sort of NFL career, where you went to school, and then how you got into how you got into, into investing. Yeah. Um, so grew up in Mahia, Texas, um, you know, uh, very small town, um, played all sports, basketball, football, uh, through the discus. Um, I was not a, a track runner. Uh, that was so wait, not... it, the, the discus is the frisbee, right? That's not the shot put, right? Yeah. So you oh, have shot put. Cool. And discus. I, I wasn't as good as as uh, I wasn't good at shot put. I mean, I could throw it, but for me, the discus was a little. It was for me. The discus was fun. Uh, it was a little bit more challenging, a little bit more coordination. Um, it, it's actually helping my golf swing a little bit. So um, that that was something that I really enjoyed uh, there in high school. But played all sports. Um, Started to really get serious about football in, in my junior year of high school. Uh, started to get recruited to, to go and play um, collegiate football. Um, ended up selling on SMU down in Dallas. Um, played all four years there. Was a, was a starter from the time that, that I, I redshirted. So redshirted my first year and then started every game. Um, after that, I think it was 52 consecutive games that, that I ended up getting in. Um, got drafted to the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2012. Uh, played four years there. Um, big deal in, in Jacksonville, big deal in New York, uh, and solid deal here in Arizona. And uh, it's been a, a great journey to date, going on a decade in the National Football League for a seventh round pick that's kind of uh, unheard of. We usually don't get in that long, but it's been a blessing um, to, to, be, you know, to, to have played this long. I've been with a number of different coaches, good, bad, indifferent. Um, have experienced quite a bit. I've seen a lot of guys come and go. So um, it's, it's a journey that I wouldn't trade for anything, but uh, one that I've put a lot of work in, a lot of time, a lot of sweat equity. I mean, a lot of people have had to sacrifice, including my wife, my kids, um, in this journey, but it's been something that, that uh, I wouldn't trade, trade, for, trade it for, for anything in the world. That, that's phenomenal. Now, a lot of NFL football players, you know, they want to they coach, they want to get into, they want to stay in the game, maybe when, when they're done with their career, you know, on the field. But, but you wanted to get involved in, in investing. So how did you get involved in investing? What kind, of, what kind of companies do you look at? What do you invest in? You know, I was, was always just a very curious individual. Um, I would say when I first got into the league and, and came into capital, it was kind of understanding the oil and gas industry. Um, you know, because I came from Texas, oil and gas was huge down here. Cattle was huge down here. So that was kind of the, the impetus. Got into, you know, got into some capital. Where do I need to put this capital? Um, oil and gas is a very bureaucrat bureaucratic, very political, very old school. Um, it's innovation happening, but it's, it's a little slower in the oil and gas industry. Um, but just kind of got attracted to drones and robotics kind of early on, you know, in my career and in my, in my development as an investor. And while I was at, you know, while I was in Pittsburgh, was kind of poking around over at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. I uh, got to see some of the things that were coming out of that particular university, started seeing a couple of pitch decks. Um, you know, the Super Bowl happened out in 2016 in San Francisco. Got to go out and experience, um, you know, San Francisco and Silicon Valley and, and, and everything that it had to offer. You know, got to go and see some uh, some of the high growth companies at the, at the time, Uber and and um, and Twitter. Um, I got to see some of and, and Facebook and got to go see how they were growing, especially the the back end of of those particular entities at the time, and just kind of got hooked. Um, and from there, I started to spend some quality time with, you know, either players who had transitioned from NFL to, to investing or people who had some type of affiliation to the Valley. 
Um, I just started, you know, immersing myself in the, in the industry. And it's been um, an industry that I'm, I'm fascinated about still. Um, try to immerse myself in the industry as much. Um, play football during the daytime and, and moonlight as an investor uh, during the nighttime. As a NFL football player, you understand offense and, and, and defense. And of course, you know, all business is, is war. So when you're looking at these investment opportunities, you know, how do you analyze what, what a, what's a good deal? Do you look at the, 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 the team? Do you look at the, 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 the market? Like, what are you looking for when you're looking to invest? You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. You get to, to really dive into everything. You get to understand the, the founding story. Why is this founder uniquely qualified to go out after this problem? Uh, understand what they've went through from a personal journey. How do they think about hiring? Um, how do you think about the market? Is the, is, are they going after a market that just needs innovation? Are they trying to create a new market? Or are they trying to create a, a derivative off of a market that's already been um, you know, entrenched in, in society for some time? Um, and then for me, I'm, I'm one of those you know, people that I love to look at the entire competitive landscape. Um, who, who's the competitors? Well, who's the best within this particular category? Um, and then, you know, make try to make a decision from there. Um, I'm one of those people that I also believe in my network. My network is everything. At the end of the day, I play football. I play football full time. Uh, I get paid to play football, but I want to be able to go and find some of the experts in some of the categories that, that I really enjoy and really love and feel that are going to be some of those categories that are um, defining um, you know, the future of, of our economy, not only our economy, but the global economy in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and lean on those experts to help help me make educated decisions. At the end of the day, I have to pull the trigger. It's my money. Um, but I want to make sure that with my money, it's a very, very educated decision um, and a decision that um, I can live with and a decision that I have conviction in. Um, so I look for conviction out of the founder and I want to be able to have conviction in, in, in the investment that I make at the end of the day. Do you find that coming out of the the NFL, just about anybody that you're calling on will take a phone call from you? Um, I'm used to rejection. So I've gotten both of them. You know, there's been times that I've sent cold emails to founders, to venture capitalists, to operators, to CEOs, and I got no response. Um, I'm cool with that. Um, and there's been times that I've gotten an open door. Um, now, what you do with that open door or what you do with that first meeting is up to you. Anybody will take a meeting. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say that nobody would take a meeting when you put tagline NFL player wants to meet you like they'll take a meeting. Now, what you do with that meeting is up to you because, you know, somebody giving you 15 minutes. Hey, hey, this is a, a NFL player. He wants to chat. All right. They give you 15 minutes. Well, will they give you an hour? Will they give you two hours? Will they give you a dinner? Will they give you, you know, hey, come and spend a half a day with me? Hey, will they, hey, will they give you, hey, let's go golf for the weekend? Like it's levels to, to the depth in, the, in that relationship. And it's on the, the, the person or the person who's reaching out to, to show yourself worthy and to show that you, you can command that type of respect and, and that type of time because everybody's time is valuable. Um, founders, entrepreneurs, your time is valuable. I mean, it's, it's, it takes, um, it's an opportunity cost that comes with every single relationship um, and every person that's reaching out in every conversation, every Zoom call now that you choose to take um and, you know in, in this particular environment so you played in pittsburgh you played mm -hmm. in uh, new jersey uh now you're out out in arizona as you're, jacksonville oh jacksonville ab absolutely but as you're going through those cities you know I, as an investor i think of investing as a geographical thing even though we're all on the internet we're all 100 milliseconds apart I have very different friends in maybe Chicago than I do Boston, than I do New York City. So as you were working in these cities, did you make contacts with the local business community, the angel networks, the venture capital funds there? And then how do those cities compare to each other? Yeah, in each city, um, in each city providing something different. You know, Pittsburgh for me was the, the, the philanthropic kickoff for, for my career. Like philanthropically, still to this day, I know all the, the, the major philanthropic players in that city which then introduced me to, to some of the folks politically, which also introduced me to some of the, the business folks in that particular city, um, which also produced, uh, introduced me to some of the, the, the green tech and the renewable energy uh, people within Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was a, you know, long ago was a uh, industrial town, huge industrial, steel, coal, the whole nine, meals, the whole nine. Um, but they really transitioned into a, a kind of clean tech and green tech type of city. So anything in renewable energy, anything in kind of the, the, the next evolution of the, the energy revolution are there in Pittsburgh. Um, in Jacksonville, Florida, 
it's a very laid back, um, you know, beach beach style uh, um, city. So the, the conversations were a little different there. All right, well, who are the, the, the family offices? Who are the, the PE firms? Who are um, the real estate um, folks in that particular arena? Um, and spent time with people in that arena. So try to find the most influential business folks in Jacksonville. Um, in New York, everybody knows somebody in New York. So the network was really kind of compounded uh, while I was there uh, in New York, but spent time with who are the top angel investors, um, who are the top GPs, um, who are the best hedge fund managers to spend time with, um, you know, who are the, the best financial anal uh, analysts, uh, who are the top traders to spend time with. So really took the time to build those relationships while I was in New York. And now here in Arizona, there is a startup community that's starting to bubble up um, here, here in Arizona, Postscripts, um, which is a company that just got a, a series a series B that was led by Greylock uh, that came out, of, uh, came out of here. There are a lot of family offices um, here. Uh, spring training is done here. So a lot of people are transient and come to Phoenix during, during the springtime. Um, so you get a, a good mix of a lot of people that come through Phoenix at some point in time. Tucson is you know, right down the street. So there's a, a nice resort out there and it's a, uh, a couple conferences that, that end up you know, going out to Tucson but they actually have to fly into Phoenix and drive there. So you know, there's a, a, a kind of differentiated type of people, a person that comes through Phoenix um, you know, time and time again. So have been blessed in each city to find little pockets and little communities um, in which I can glean, uh, glean from and also give to. Um, so it's been, it's been a blessing to, to be able to experience all those. And, you know, I look back at it, should I have stayed in Pittsburgh and, you know, signed a, a multi-year deal in Pittsburgh? I could have. Um, but I think I, don't, I, I wouldn't be the same person that I am if I would have stayed in that environment my entire career, looking back on it. Um, and it was hard to make that decision. We had a, we had a, a great setup in Pittsburgh, had a godparents. Uh, for our kids in Pittsburgh, had a, had a really nice um, townhome in Pittsburgh. I mean, it, it, it was set up for, for a fairy tale ending. Um, but I think with, with the experience that we've had to date, we've had the ability to really grow as individuals and grow as people. Um, and for me, you know, and my wife, uh, our business acumen has grown due to us continuing to have to adjust uh, from city to city. I think that's well said. It's not, it's not the list of people who you know, it's it's the relationships you've built and maintained, you know, throughout throughout this time. Um, so when when you meet these different uh, business people, that was it like angel networks and the the philanthropic people and the politicians, are aren't they often all working on the same problem? Like like we're going to talk about cybersecurity here in a second, but like with green tech, with uh, like like training people, retraining people for for you know veterans and and, and getting more people into, into tech. There's philanthropy organizations doing that. There's commercial companies doing that. There's political programs doing it. It's all the same thing, isn't it? It's all the same thing. And, there, and the thing is, 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 you know, one thing that I've always said is, why can't we all just work together <laughs> in some shape, form, or fashion? Uh, because at, at some point, all we're trying to do and, and all most people are trying to do in these markets or make the lives better for the people in those markets, whether it's people that are trying to get into the, in the workforce, people who are trying to stay in the workforce, people who are trying to you know, have wealth creation within um, their particular communities or wealth creation within their companies. Um, but whether it's philanthropic, philanthropically, politically, on the investment front, um, you know, it's private sector, public sector. Um, they're trying to do everything that they can to just make, for one, make money at the end of the day, but also make the lives of those people in those communities, um, you know, a part of, of that wealth creation as well. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the organizations you support and then pivot to some of the companies you, you've invested in. So what are some of the, the nonprofit uh, organizations that you've uh, been spending some time and resources with? Yeah, I have, have spent a lot of time um, with Feed America. So Feed America is kind of the umbrella organization that oversees all the different food banks uh, across uh, the United States. Um, in every city that I've ever played in, um, that's probably the first relationship that I start to, to, to work on is who is the local food bank in that, in that city. So in Pittsburgh, the Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank, um, in um, Jacksonville, it was the Northeast Florida Food Bank. Um, in New York, uh, it was a, the Food Bank for New York. Here in Arizona, it's the United Way, uh, well, United, United um, Food Bank. They also have St. Mary's Food Bank. Uh, but Feeding America, and I sit on the Entertainment Council for Feeding, Feeding America. They oversee every single food bank across the nation. And in my, in my home state, um, North Texas, um, uh, North Texas Food Bank, and then also Central Texas Food Bank. And I've worked with 
and like I said, in every city or every location, either that I'm from or that or any location that I've played in, I've worked with that particular food bank um, in a number of different capacities over the years. Um, and then secondly, it's been World Vision. So on the global front, um, where you know I'm you know being able to work in third world countries and being able to provide access to clean water, um, you know, World Vision has been that partner. Um, met them back in 2016. Um, actually flew down to Nashville to have the first meeting with them. Um, and it's been an organic and real relationship over the years um, where we've been able to work. Or we were supposed to go to, to um, Uganda last year. A couple of years ago, we went to Honduras um, and have just, you know, had a chance to kind of just dive into some of the areas who, who have the greatest need and find a way to bring not only awareness, but also resources. And, you know, for when I put my own resources behind it and where I'm able to galvanize and bring some others along, I um, have found a way to do that, uh, do that as well. Um, and then on the education front, um, STEM technology or STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics has been a passion of mine, trying to get young people to understand the, the, the power uh, of STEM or STEAM and, and the ability in which they can uh, play a role um, in this, this, this tech economy that's continuing to, to take over, um, you know, the global economy. So really interested in just being able to serve people and have been able to serve people in both hunger um, and access to clean water and STEM education. Hungry stomachs, hungry minds. That's uh, that's that's excellent. <laughs> Were you involved in any of the relief ac- efforts in uh, Texas during the uh, the winter storm? I know there's some NFL football players involved uh, with that. Always, always. I mean, anything that happens in Texas in, in any shape, form, or fashion, um, I'm working with some of the partners there. Um, awesome. A lot of my stuff, I do it behind closed doors, and I wouldn't say under the table, but you know, th- that's my home state. And I, I don't want to do is be able to serve. And I don't, you know, I don't need to, to have public recognition for it. Just been able to do it because that's what needs to be done. So um, if, if anything that happens in Texas, at some point in time, um, I'm putting either resources, I'm connecting the dots for somebody else or finding a way to serve my home state as best I can. That's excellent. Let's now let's talk about some of the companies you've in, invested in. And we got introduced because you were interested in looking at cybersecurity companies. So we'll mm-hmm. We'll start talking about that in a second, but you mentioned drones, you mentioned clean energy. What what sort of things are you been happy that you would like to talk about and share with the viewers? Yeah, you know, on the drone front, man, really excited about the companies that I've had a chance to, to put some money behind. Uh, one being Skydio, uh, which is doing really well. Uh, drone Racing League, which I'm really excited about Drone Racing League and what they're able to do and and their um, their disruption of what sports means to, to, to the millennial um, or Gen Z. Um, person right now. Um, and then the global ramifications that they have. You think about technology, I talked about STEM earlier. You think about the technology that's being used and the way in which you can do something fun, something sports related, and also it'd be technical. Um, so really excited about uh, what Drone Racing League has done. Um, you know, on the robotics, uh, the robotics front, I still haven't found that, that go-to uh, robotics company just yet, but have been poking around at that particular industry for the longest. Um, but, you know, when you think about energy, um, robotics, clean energy. There's a, a company called Uncharted Power um, based in uh, Harlem, run by the founder, Jessica Matthews, that um, is doing some amazing things on the clean energy front. Um, and it's taken that from, you know, just the concept of clean energy and being able to put it in everyday, um, uh, everyday situations, use cases. And her first use cases, um, it was a soccer ball where you would kick a soccer ball around for um, a couple minutes and, you know, it started in kind of underdeveloped countries, brought it here. Um, kick that soccer ball around for a little while, put it in the socket, and you, that will provide your light. Uh, you can jump rope, jump rope for a while, put that socket from the jump rope in, and that will provide light. And now it's taking that that's very, very small use case and now turning it into, hey, you can go walking on the sidewalk, and then that sidewalk will provide the energy for that microgrid or that grid within that particular city. So have been blessed and fortunate to meet some outstanding and very um, smart individuals and founders um, who are building, you know, not only in San Francisco, but also New York. And I'm just continuing to, to, to learn. At the end of the day, you know, investing is great. But for me, the, the learning process that, that, that comes with investing is, is just as important. Was there a deal that you wanted to do? Was there a company or a founder you wanted to work with and that somehow you missed the window? There, there wasn't an opportunity for you to invest? Um, I think there's been there's been a couple, some that I'm glad that I missed on, and some that I that I'm that I'm not too glad that I missed on. It's a very uh, wise way to talk about that. <laughs> Why you say it like that? Well, um, okay. Well, let's let's. Uh, I think we all have companies that we almost invested in, and then for whatever reason we didn't. 
And then we found out later that, I don't know, maybe it wasn't a good investment, right? Maybe the tech wasn't as good. Maybe some better opportunity came along. Timing's everything. Timing is everything. Um, you know, I, I talk about, you know, drones and, 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 um, and robotics. Um, you know, I would say companies that, that I liked, I love, you know, I, I love being in the air. I think that's where robotics and drones kind of, kind of come out. And, and there's an aviation company called Wheels Up um, that I thought was interesting. I used them, didn't have the greatest experience. And I look back at it, I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't put money into that company. Um, I happen to see uh, a company called Coinbase that's going public uh, probably here in a couple of weeks. Um, I saw it at the Series C. I had no idea what crypto was. I didn't take the time to, to dive in enough and, and actually spend time and talk with the founder. And now that company is doing extremely well right now and going to be a public company. So um, I think you you have misses, on, misses that you wanted and also misses that probably wasn't the best company for you. Um, that are a part of the journey, but I, you know, I don't think you will be an investor that's that's been in the space long enough if you hadn't had either misses or ones that you, you know, thought you should have got in that you didn't get in, or ones that you shouldn't have got in that you didn't get in. You know, so you know, like you said, time gives everything. But I've had, you know, had experiences on both both ends of the spectrum. Uh, both ends of the spectrum. How do you handle? You're doing diligence on a company. Maybe you want to invest, and maybe one of your fellow NFL players says, "Hey." Can I put some money into that deal too? How do you handle that kind of situation? You know, I've only had one teammate that um, I've allowed to, to, to invest with me, honestly. Um, the very reason is I don't want to be responsible for another teammate's money. Um, what I choose to do with my money and the risk that I choose to take with my money is the risk that I've, that I've associated with my capital. Um, I am not an asset allocator for another athlete. Um, I am not an advisor. I am not a trained advisor on how an athlete is supposed to invest or any other person is, is supposed to invest. I, I don't do syndicates. I don't go asking other people, hey, I, I got this allocation. I think you should put money in. I'm not that type of person. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the, the guts just yet to say that, hey, I want to manage somebody else's money or I want to manage how you deploy capital or, hey, you should put money into this, you know? Um, if it's an institution, yes, I'm sharing deals with the institution. Hey, this is something that I'm looking at. I think you should take some time with it. If you if you go through your diligence and it meets your requirements, hey, I think it'd be a good check for you. But personally, I have not uh, had an athlete come up to me and say, hey, Kelvin, I see you doing that deal. You should think, you know, I want to put some money in. Now I have told athletes, hey, you should think about this company. This company is doing pretty well. Um, you, should, you should at least know about them. Um, and I've told a number of athletes about it, especially those who came to me and said, hey, Kevin, I'm interested in this particular asset class. Um, but there's only been one athlete that, that I've actually um, done that with, where they came to me and said, hey, Kevin, this is a deal that, that's going down. I, I heard you're in it. I want to put some money into. So very selective with that because, you know, you've seen the stories, you've seen the horror stories about all the guys who've lost, lost out on money. Um, I don't want to be... Um, involved in, in, in anybody losing money, um, especially hard earned money. It's, it's hard to play the game of football. Uh, it's a lot of, lot of uh, hardship that comes on your body. So don't want to be the reason in which um, uh, an athlete, especially NFL player lost out on money. Do you ever have to go down the road with the potential uh, company you want to invest in and kind of really tell them that you actually do know what you're doing? You're just, you're just not an NFL player. Like do, do some people, do they ask you questions like, okay, this is a term sheet. This is a uh, convertible note, you know, let me walk you through. And you're like, hey, dude, you know, I'm, I'm going to be with you when you do your A and your B, and I'm going to help you raise and stuff like that. You know, it, it's interesting because um, now people have no idea that I play football. They think that, you know, I'm, I'm working for a firm or I'm trying to get allocation for a select group of people. Um, and I think after we talk for five to 10 minutes, they realize that I'm not just an athlete uh, who doesn't know what he's talking about. And usually the people that I'm getting introduced to or the person that's making an introduction is highly qualified. So I'm having to skip that whole step, you know, of, but does he really know what he's talking about? Um, so I, I've kind of, I don't think I've ever had to experience that because I guess I came in the door ready to answer to answer those questions and be ready for for those comments, um, 
from the get-go, I always wanted to be able to prove to everybody in market, especially within the, the venture landscape and kind of angel investing and early stage investing that I was serious. And I was serious about what I was doing, how I was doing it, who I was doing it with, why I was doing it, and the, the efficacy and the velocity in which I was doing it. So I came correct. Um, if you said, hey, these are the terms, I would ask, hey, why, why are the terms this way? Why, you know, why, why are you thinking about the valuation in this, this particular instance? Well, the lead said it, cool. All right, the lead said it, here, here are the terms. All right, let me send, send the docs over. I get them spent back uh, before the end of the day. And if you wanna do a DocuSign, that'd be much easier. I can get it done between practice. Like, I get it. Um, but I've done the prep work to make sure that when I got to this point, I knew what a term sheet was, what warrants were, what a convertible note was, what a safe was. I read venture deals before I started doing deals, um, you know, by Brad Fell, which I, I recommend, especially when, when athletes come and talk to me about doing venture. Here's the book that you need to make sure that you read before, you know, looking at a deal, evaluating a deal, put money into a deal. So you ac actually know what's going on. Yeah. So sort of last general question before we start talking about cybersecurity stuff. So, so do you get pitched sports, all uh, the time. you know, sports companies all the time? All the time. I, I really it's very rare that I actually put money into a sports related company at this point. Um, reason being, if you look at and me, and me and Courtside Ventures is a, is, a, is, a, is a friendly firm that I spent a lot of time collaborating with, um, know all the partners there. And we always have this discussion around sports tech and what's sports and what's wellness and what's, you know, I guess sports and wellness in general. But when you think about sports tech and I'm talking about companies trying to sell directly into teams or directly into leagues, there hasn't been an exit um, in that particular space, over $250 million. Um, so for me, if I'm going to be putting money into a company, I'm cool with getting singles, doubles, and triples. But if you're in venture, you want to be able to have some of these 10Xs, some of the 20Xs. And within sports tech in that very niche market, there hasn't been those types of exits. Um, so very selective where not only I put capital, but also where I spend time. So even now, I'm willing to be an advisor to companies. Um, and willing to, to spend time with these companies, but I wanna see that there's something differentiated about what you're building in the sports arena. Um, then some of the, the incumbents uh, or some of the ones that are you know considered peers at this time, but get pitched sports tech companies all the time or sports centric companies all the time. Absolutely, lose weight, run faster, lift more, it's all good. <laughs> so, so we got introduced you know, to talk about cybersecurity. So what is your interest in the cybersecurity market? And what are some observations you, you've you been able to make about, about the market, uh, you know, coming out of the NFL and sort of being what I consider a broader tech investor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you, when you think about cyber, um, I think you have to, to come to the realization that cyber is here to stay, first and foremost. Cyber is um, a part of the fabric of what we need in technology. And there hasn't been enough awareness to say that as a society, we realize the impacts of breaches in cyber um, and breaches in security. And I would take it a step further. If you look at where the next, I mean, you know, not to say that there's gonna be a world war, but if you look at where the next world war could be, it would be on the cyber front, in my opinion. Um, so have really been fascinated with um, everything that, that is impacting security and impacting um, the security of me as an athlete, the security of the National Football League, the security of data, uh, with data becoming such a, a big thing and big data becoming such a big thing. How do you protect it and how do you protect it at scale? Um, so it's been something that, you know, I've been spending a lot of time with. I actually hosted uh, this conference called ITSMF a couple years ago and actually had a number of different panels on this very topic of cybersecurity and being able to pull some of the top um, African-American um, cybersecurity specialists together to, to, to be able to, and they actually have the conference on a yearly basis, but I just happened to sponsor it uh, a couple years ago to better understand um, what was going on within the cyber landscape and, and, and had you know cyber specialists from the NFL, from the NBA, um, from, um, uh, uh, Cox Enterprises, from um, Bank of America, from Walmart, from Wells Fargo, um, just be able to, 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 to educate me um, 
as well as the conference about some of the, the, the new happenings and, you know, have been able to spend time with CISOs and, and, and CIOs uh, talking about this very thing and have not only looked at it at the earlier stages, uh, but I've also looked at it uh, within some of the growth stages. You know, you have the RSA conference out in, in, uh, in, in uh, San Francisco that didn't happen this year, um, but was a conference that was recommended to me as I was spending time um, in the particular category and have, you know, had just been poking around. Um, and for me, I like to dive into those areas first uh, before uh, putting a check into the to the arena, but have really just been spending time in cyber and how we got connected. Dave, um, Dave was doing work um, at, um, well, for the university, well, not the university, but for the state of New Jersey. And, you know, got to telling him about what I was looking at. He was working at a, at a startup at the time. And it's just been an organic relationship. We got connected. Um, you're a cyber specialist. So I'm like, well, if this is a cyber specialist, everything I see in cyber, here's, here's an expert that I can send, you know, my, my, my cyber deals to. And, you know, anything in security you, you look at, but you have a, a keen focus on cyber security. So it's been just this organic um, kind of exploration and curiosity into the sector um, and haven't made any direct investments just yet, but have continued to spend a lot of time um, with folks in the industry. Is there a, um, maybe at the time it was a misconception, but is there a thought that you had about maybe passwords or computer security when you were, before you were investing, you know, while you were, were maybe coming in through the NFL versus what you have now? Like, is there something that surprised you about the cybersecurity uh, landscape? You know, first, that, you know, there aren't a lot of people that look like me, first and foremost, with, within the category. I mean, that's something that, you know, we both know and both understand and both want to be able to, to equip the next generation to understand. Um, and that too is extremely old. Like, there are just, it's just a lot of older people. You don't see a lot of young people in this category. Um, so those are the two things that, that I've seen. And, you know, you, you, you see all these companies that are sprouting up so fast, that are building so fast, but are they building with cyber in mind? Are they building with um, a mindset to want to make sure that they're, they're still secure? They're, you know, still able to, to, to grow, you know, into these huge conglomerates with protecting people's information at the end of the day. Um, and for me, that's been something that, um, I didn't know when I first started, you know, getting into it until I, I mean, I got my identity stolen. So verification became something that I was very, very aware of and very keen on. Um, and then as I started to spend more time as a, as an NFL uh, representative, NFL PA representative, realizing how important our data was. Um, and as I made more investments, especially with uh, a company called Whoop Technology, um, that was really data centric. Well, how do we protect the data that you're now collecting? Um, uh, on a player, how do you protect that? So it's been what was, these. What was the name of that company, just so we can get it for everybody? Whoop W O. I mean W H O O P. Whoop Great. Technology. Great. Uh, World of Technology. Um, and it's one of those questions that I've continued. You know that I that I asked Will, the founder, that I asked the NFLPA um, when they also you know put money behind the company. Um, so it's been one of those things that I've just been you know just again just curious about uh, to learn about. Um, and to make sure that you know guys understand it and guys see that this is is an opportunity for you to for one educate yourself but also realize that there's some some um some opportunities to invest in this category now it's hard and i'm not going to sit here and say that it's easy i mean you've we've had our conversations offline about just how difficult it is um in this particular category and how long it does take and 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 um the exit multiples in, in this category but it's something that you know i feel is something i want to spend a little time with well, let's talk a bit more about bringing more, uh, just for the folks who are listening and not watching the video, um, my guest is not white. <laughs> it's always fun. Um, but uh, how do we get more African Americans, you know, into cybersecurity? Uh, you know, we just got, came off of the Google Tech Foundation uh, grant where we, we uh, awarded a number of nonprofits who this was their, their, their main focus. But you know, it's so hard to talk about cybersecurity because you're right. It's it's a lot of you know older older than me. You know, white dudes who kind of did a lot there, and and the, you don't have that that decades of mentorship and you know people telling people, hey, you should get into this. And we've even done a poor job in the school system, you know, teaching guidance counselors about cybersecurity because we let we let TV and the movies kind of dictate that it's all 
you know, uh, hackers with hoodies and that sort of thing. So what are some of the ways you think we can get uh, more African-Americans into cybersecurity? Yeah, you know, I think for one, you mentioned hackers, like there are ways in which to do hackathons that are very beneficial um, to society, you know, uh, with these hackathons or, and I, and I can speak to, to the National Society of Black Engineers, they've tried to do this at scale um, and being able to bring these hackathons uh, to the forefront. Um, I think about um, uh, organizations um, such as Bug Crowd, which is a, a venture backed startup around, you know, hacking, where you've been able to, you know, they're very community minded and just trying to bring people into the community. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's, 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 you know, much like I said earlier on, like, we got to find a way to work together, both the public sector, the private sector. Understanding as in America right now, we're struggling from a cyber standpoint with the cyber attacks from, from all different kinds of countries. Um, how do we make sure that uh, our young people understand what's going on and how do we make sure that we bring, we, we bring them along, um, you know, for the ride? And that's people from all different types of nationalities and, and all different ethnicities. But as it pertains to, to African-American people, it's, it's being able to one, bring to light the ones that are already in it and the folks that are already in it. I think about, um, this this woman, Window Snyder, uh, I hope I'm saying her name right there, used to be at Fastly um, and also used to be at um, uh, Square. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal woman who's extremely brilliant. Um, like, we should make sure that our young people know about her and the, and the ability that, she, that she's done as a CISO and some of the, the most, you know, well-known brands uh, in the world. Um, how do we make sure that, that, that folks know about her? So it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's educating and uplifting the folks that are already in it. And then just being very intentional uh, about bringing others along um, for the ride and the opportunity to, to, to learn um, within this sector, because this sector, is, it's not going away. It's not going away, it's here to stay. It's, it's, a, it's a battlefront for our military right now. Um, so how do we support our military and making sure that the next generation knows about this? Um, and the best way to make sure that it's inclusive because this fight is going to be very inclusive. I mean, you're, you're, you're interacting with, again, countries a lot of all, all over the world. Uh, you have to make sure it's inclusive. Um, so it's just being very intentional about that. And, and for me, it's anytime I see organizations or uh, foundations or, or entities being very intentional about that, it's, it's inspiring and, and I always want to find a way to get involved in, and find ways to collaborate. So if you were in... Uh at a high school football game you saw a young african-american football star who thinks he's going to go all the way and you start coaching him you start mentoring you're you're eventually going to say hey look you're probably going to make a lot of money and 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 it's not all about the money but you can take care of your family you can you can do good for the church you can do good for others it's more than just just you at that point i sometimes wonder if we don't tell people who should be thinking about getting into cybersecurity that there's actually some some really good quality of life uh, benefits, uh, good salaries, good people, good working conditions. I, what, what do you think about that? You know, to be honest with you, I, I used to, to run a football camp back in my hometown. And as I, as I got more educated, as I started spending more time within these ecosystems where you have this wealth generation happening, I started to get to a point where I'm like, why am I, why am I still hosting a football camp? Like, why am I trying to tell young people that football is the way to go, or sports is the way to go. And it's no disrespect to sports. Um, I made a point that I, you know, personally, I don't give money to, even though I, even though I played in Little League, I played kind of peewee football and played in Little Dribblers, which is basketball leagues. I don't give money to them. I just, I made a decision that that's not what I want to do with my funds. If you want me to educate your brain and feed your brain, I'm more interested in feeding your brain than giving you another basketball, another football. Because I realized out of my hometown, that's only been two people in a hundred years that has ever played in the NFL from my hometown. Two. Who's, who's the other one? Ray Rhodes. <laughs> Excellent. It's very, 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 very hard to get to the National Football League. I don't know anybody from my hometown that's ever played in the NBA. I don't know anybody that's ever played in the MLB from my hometown. Never, never played in the MLS, had been a professional golfer. It is very, very hard to be a professional. So what I tell a lot of people and a lot of kids now, 
everybody, everybody can't go pro in football, but everybody can go pro in STEM, or in this case, cyber, because there are so many, it's so much more room to grow within this particular category than it is football. So what I tell young people now, I got God kids, I got a son. I mean, I got a son that's three. He, he's just now realizing that daddy plays football. I try to do everything that I can to not say, hey, don't be a kid, don't play sports, you know, don't enjoy life. But man, let's put a book in your hand. Let's show you how to code. Let's show you how to hack. You know, let's do something else that, that really feeds the mind that allows our young people to realize that there are more ways out uh, of, of their environments and of their communities and just playing sports. For me, that was the only option that I had. And for some people that may be the only option, but for the platform that I have, I wanna be able to make sure that I educate young people, especially people that look like me, that there are other ways in which to make money and to create wealth generation than putting your body on the line uh, to play sports. And it may sound stupid coming from me, but having um, three kids, I realize um, how much different that is. And you know, having a mother and a father, my dad asked me after every year, hey, are you, you thinking about shutting it down? Uh, because he understands uh, the toll that it takes. So seeing it from both ends of the spectrum, realizing that there are, there are so many other opportunities to be able to make outstanding income and be able to provide a, a great life for you and your family where you can be able to utilize your brain instead of your bronze. I think that's very, very well said. And another thing just to kind of get on top of the, the whole cybersecurity, not inspiring people to, to come and want to join them. We also haven't done a great job sort of inspiring people to defend the country from China, you know, defend a country from these ransomware hackers and whatnot. So one of the things my wife and I have done is try to rebrand or, or expand cybersecurity, this concept called data care. And I know we had a chance to, to, to think about it. We've discussed it on the, the, the show before, but we, we've pitched data care to young, you know, let's call it uh, minorities uh, uh, in a wide variety of things. And they've all said, wow, we like that pitch a lot better than just the cybersecurity pitch. How, how do you react to that? You know, sometimes um, messaging and wording matters and, and words matter. Um, and, and being able to, to get people to understand exactly what you're saying and, and, and bring it, I'm not gonna say dumb it down, but simplify it where, it's more digestible, um, allows people, allows, I guess, folks to kind of just better be able to digest it. Uh, data care. It sounds like, wow, I can be a part of this versus cyber care or cyber security. Um, I'm, I'm a, when I hear data care, I think about, wow, I'm allowed to be a participant and, you know, caring for my, for my, for my data. Um, and I think that that verbiage and, and that and that particular go to market strategy is actually something that is um, is impressive and it allows people to, to, to feel like it's something of their own and something that they get to participate in. Well, one of the reasons we did this is because of, you know, racism, whether it's real or perceived, mm -hmm. it's a barrier. And, and if you've got that to overcome and you've got to become a cybersecurity expert before you can kind of get anywhere, that doesn't inspire people to join this field, but if, but if you can get maybe even just, just a help desk cert certificate, you know, I can patch my computers, I can get the, the, the corporate phones, make them secure. You know, we want to make sure people are included because that's the kind of basic stuff that people are missing. Yeah, it's great. We got to go fight solar winds and keep people off of our exchange servers and stuff, but there is so much basic stuff that's committed, uh, that's enabling people to commit billions, trillions of dollars of cybercrime we need a lot more people in this career field. And if you've got a foot in the door, you could be a chief information security officer. You could be the next Winnow Snyder. You could be the next uh, you, you know, a person on CNN talking about how they caught the Iranian hackers breaking into the Pentagon. Yeah, exactly. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, it's just, I don't know if this is just this fascination that everybody feels that they want to, you know, you, it's, it's nothing wrong with holding a Lombardi trophy. I hadn't held it yet and I've been in the league for 10 years. It's hard to get there. But it's something to say that you've been able to protect 100 million people um, from losing something that they fought so hard for, you know. Um, so I, I feel that there's there's so many ways uh, in which to be able to serve not only our country but serve your family and serve the constituents in which um, you know you came from, or the community or the environment in which you came from. I mean, there's a way to do that uh, on the data front. Um, and there's a way to do that uh, with data care or uh, with data care. Um, so excited about what you all are doing and excited about the, the work that you all are continuing to do in the community and just how authentic uh, the work 
is. Um, and I know you all are, are running a DMV area right now, um, being able to serve the population. I'm excited to see y'all expand and, and I think this is something that, um, you know, I know the NFL uh, should be thinking about and the NBA um, because it's, it's, it's NBA cares um, is something that, that, that the NBA has been doing for a number of years. They also have probably one of the best tech conferences, uh, the NBA uh, Tech Summit. Um, it was suspended this past year, but probably one of the best tech summits in the world. Um, and to, to, to be able to, 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 to talk with them about, you know, how to better inspire and, and better equip our young people is something that needs to be considered. I definitely appreciate that. I, I'm also very much pro creation of companies as a way to kind of stimulate the economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when I used to run Tenable Network Security, you know, we, we had almost a thousand people at the time and people would say, are they all cyber hackers? And of course we had some really, really good reverse engineers, programmers, but we also had marketing people, salespeople, lawyer people, we had facilities people, we had, we had, we had just so many different types and that benefits the entire community. So I really believe that any of these NFL cities, if you're talking about making a difference, if we can start cybersecurity companies and grow them into what's needed, it can have a huge impact on the, on the country. Now you need to, I was just thinking about that, man, there's a, a kind of incubation type of thing that's happening up in Milwaukee. Um, that if you could, you know, y'all should probably connect uh, because I would imagine there's some incubation that could be done uh, just within that market. Uh, the Green Bay Packers just opened up, it was like, it's like an innovation lab and collaborating with the Bucks and uh, what's the other Milwaukee sports team? The Bucks, the Packers. Uh, Vikings? No. I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the region. I got to get a map. Yeah, it's in the region. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's the, it's, it's, you have the football team, the Packers, the baseball team. What's the hockey team? Oh, my gosh. I'll get, I'll get a visceral. It's a cybersecurity fiction show. It's not a sport. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but, I mean, they got some stuff going on. But I think you should y'all should definitely connect because it, it, it will probably be smart to probably incubate. Um, and I'm all about incubation. I, I love just the concept of incubation because you're actually able to walk with somebody and, and see the, the the passion for somebody and see them grow um, and see them grow from, you know, the, idea, the, the ideation stage to formation and formation to precede, precede to seed and hopefully IPO, uh, but to be able to incubate a company. If it's not an IPO, it's, it's, the, it's an acquisition that's able to happen, but it's, it's, it's being able, like you talk about, there's so many other facets of, of cyber that you're able to build on, the, the, the software engineers, the, the UI and, 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 and UX designers, um, you know, the, the lawyers, the, the marketing professionals, the sales professionals that all come along with this particular industry. Um, but you should know about them and y'all should, should connect because it'd be cool to incubate something in the Midwest there. Yeah, please do. Please hook us up. Please so do. I mentioned fiction. Now you're broad tech. You're doing, you're doing clean. You do want to do cyber, do robotics. What kind of science fiction have you seen in these, like, have you gotten pitched something and you're like, man, that, that would have made a good movie, but maybe I'll invest in this company. Um, NFTs a couple years ago, now it's become real. <laughs> um, you know, if I, if I'm looking at anything sci-fi oriented, I send it over to Lux, Lux Capital. Uh, I would, I would say Lux Capital is probably the most innovative and futuristic firm, um, and investing in the most futuristic, um, things in the world. Um, and they've been able to turn these futuristic things in, in, into real companies and these real companies that turned into to, to, to billion dollar outcomes. Um, but I haven't seen enough, but when I do, I send them their way. Um, but you know, it's it's hard to say what could now turn into science fiction because with technology, this stuff can actually become pretty real now. Um, so it's kind of hard to say, hey, something is sci-fi and it's futuristic because what, what was futuristic five years ago is now real. Like, if you would have told me somebody would have sold a sold a, 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 a NFT for $69 million five years ago, I said, you're stupid. If you would have said that the people that started CryptoKitties, I saw the deal, um, CryptoKitties in 2018, and that the company that, that kind of incubated and started that stuff was over $2 billion, you know, they're valued at over $2 billion right now. I said, you're crazy. Like, it's just not possible. Um, but that's the, the power of technology and the power of human capital. And when you're able to pull the right human capital together. Um, so, man, it's hard to say that, things of science fiction because it's like science fiction has become a reality now are there science fiction shows or movies that are you think are more um more likely to be visions of our own future like like minority report uh you know uh blade runner like 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 is that oh, i love blade runner. 
Yeah. Love Blade Runner. Do you, Love do you, think, Runner. you think we're heading to like a minority report, a demolition man kind of future <laughs> society where everything's like like cotton candy and, and, and sugar coated? Or do you think you it's know, like Blade Runner where we're just going to have, uh, you know, drones doing our work for us, androids? Well, I mean, that's, that's why I love drones, man. Uh, but but I have no idea. You know, for me, I look at companies like Inception, and 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 just the the, the alternative worlds that either we're able to create or we're able to be a part of. Um, it's fascinating. But man, I, I get for me, those are some of the best movies, honestly, uh, because they give you just you know a, a glimpse into. I'm not going to say what may be, but they. I mean, they they they're. they're they're fun and they're interesting. They make you think. I think about, you know, Endgame, um, Marvel's Endgame and all the different going back in time, you know, adjusting just one thing in, in, in time and how that changed how the rest of the movie went. Like, I just find those things to be um, really interesting, honestly. And, and then, of course, if we're going to do, do that, we got to talk about Tenet, right, where you can go back in time, not change it, but understand it better. Did you happen to see Tenet? I hadn't seen Tenet yet. Oh, sorry. Um, well, it's a time travel movie. It's great. I didn't really ruin it for you because you can watch it five times and get something <laughs> different out of it every time. Um, what what, uh, what kind of sci-fi have you watched recently that you liked? Let's see, the last sci-fi, like I, I, I actually was waiting on Blade Runner. So you had Maze Runner, you had Blade Runner. It was supposed to be another one that came out, but the guy, the stuntman got hurt. The guy, like the main guy in it. Um, those are kind of the last sci-fi movies that I can think about that I really enjoyed. Um, one of them got a little too zombie-like. That's the only thing I don't like about some of these, you know, sci-fi movies. It's like, it's super sci-fi for, you know, like the first two movies. Um, and then it takes a, a completely different journey. Like for me, um, uh, it's not to kill a Mockingbird, but Mock and Jay. Mock and Jay for me had a little sci-fi to it. But towards the end of, of that particular series, it turned into like this military, you know, There's gotta be a big, big land battle with lasers and laser swords and flying drops. Yeah. yeah. You know, it just it just turned into to, to, to something else, you know, where you had this kind of sci-fi feel to it at the beginning. Um, but it's been it's been a while since I've really dove into like, you know, a, a true sci-fi movie and a true sci-fi series as of late. Um, that's excellent. I appreciate you sharing that. So for our viewers, if they want to find you, which is a dangerous thing when you're a famous NFL football player and you're investing both in nonprofit organizations and investing in companies, where can people go to find you? Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all at Kelvin Beecham Jr. Uh, pretty simple. Um, my face stays the same in, in, in most of the, the images on all those, uh, but those are the best places to find me. I uh, also have a website, kelvinbeecham.com, um, where you can go and, and check out and peruse. I give you a little glimpse into some of my baby pictures and my, my, uh, my younger life, um, and also kind of provide some context on the philanthropic work and, and some of the work that I've done in the community over the years. That's awesome. And for the NFL season coming up, when's your first uh, pregame season game? I have no idea. The schedule hasn't come out. Uh, we're actually negotiating with the with the league right now about our off season, so we'll see uh, what transpires. COVID has put a, a damper in, in, in a lot of plans for a lot of people. Um, same for us. We're human as well, and have no idea uh, when we're actually going to be reporting to to off season and, and when training camp is supposed to report. But uh, once the season, uh, well, once the schedule comes out, I think it comes out uh, the next to last week of April. Uh, we'll know when that first game will be. Well, I'm getting my first COVID shot pretty soon here, and I expect most of the nation's going to be vaccinated, and we're going to be back to normal rooting in the uh, NFL real soon. So, Kelvin, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, best of luck you this season. Best even luck in the offseason doing your investing. Thanks again. Yes, sir. Thanks so much, Ron.